Mini episode 1184 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by Sportsology, delivering unconventional columns and webcasts about sports, TV, music, movies, and more. Follow them on the web at sportsology.com. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Hello, everyone. Welcome to FDH Lounge mini episode 1184. This is FDH managing partner Rick Morris here. We're going to set this up here. This is the first in a six-part series celebrating the 13th anniversary of the FDH Lounge. I have a panel here today to break down something that is not exactly Pantheon, as we've done previously, but Pantheon adjacent, shall we say. And with that, I'm going to bring in uh, the first uh, gentleman to introduce here, fellow FDH Lounge original dignitary, Chris Galloway, and uh, the guy who I ran this past as far as setting up the format of this thing, because Chris has been... I think all throughout as we've been going along, sort of my rabbi on all things Pantheon and uh, how we should approach this. He was the guy who conceptualized the Pantheon Redemption and some of the categories that needed to be uh, readdressed when we voted for the best of the best of all time in different categories. So I said, Chris, what do you think we ought to do here? We want to review the 2010s, preview the 2020s, going to do a survey with the peeps here in the FDH Academy of Arts and Sciences. What do you think we should do? He said... Just go kind of broad, just just don't be too specific in what you're asking people, and I think he even said specifically that the magic and how we've done this has been from you never know where it's going to come from, which we already know from looking at the survey results, I'm sure it will bear out in the discussion as well. So Chris, uh, vindicated thus far, I think you will be vindicated in the discussions, but uh, very good advice from you. Oh, and uh, thank you, and I'm thrilled to be here today uh, to go through this uh, fantastic litany of topics and talking points. We have an awful lot to uh, to get through here in the six different categories that we're going to approach. Sports is the first one. Subsequent ones will be American news, uh, world news, technology, entertainment, slash pop culture, and pro wrestling, just because it's tradition here on the show. We actually addressed uh, pro wrestling in an initial segment, January 14th, 2007, when we were still doing this live at the old Sports Talk Network. So going around the table with the other dignitaries. Oh, one last thing also as well with, with Chris, uh, and that being uh, I should do this uh, live and on air here as, as far as deeming this. Uh, for extra titles that we have bestowed thus far in the past, another one of our original dignitaries, Nate Noy, is now the Director of Research for the FDH Lounge. Uh, you, Chris Galloway, I would like to deem you in this, especially since we're looking at the 2020s, you are now the Chief Futurist for the FDH Lounge. You have the keenest interest in futurist matters and anything of anyone I know. That so. feels like that could be one hell of a burden. That's your portfolio, my man. <laughs> you, you, you know portfolios from the political realm. How you know it from here? Fantastic. Our chief futurist slash visionary, uh, going around the table. Some other uh, visionaries as well. I mentioned Sports Talk Network, a gentleman I met and got to be friends with there, and have co-produced many things with over a period of time, and somebody who has been a regular participant, uh, along with his brother Matt, who could not be with us today. Long story. But uh, on many of these Pantheon panels, good friend Anthony Patron. Uh, and uh, Anthony, a pleasure to have you here as always. Thank you for making your way up and uh, look forward to getting your thoughts on this. Appreciate your survey answers as well. Pleasure to be here. Wouldn't miss it. Yeah, I know you wouldn't. I really appreciate it. I uh, can always count on you for these type things. Uh, a guy that you have been on some of these panels with previously, much like with, uh, with Chris, Good friend John Adams, uh, who has uh, been a regular on this and a uh, participant in some of our FantasyDraftHelp.com golf and tennis competitions, uh, and uh, we have really uh, enjoyed those. we got another tennis season ready to come here, but uh, good friend uh, Johnny Adams, longtime contributor uh, to the show. Johnny, great to have you as always. Always great to be here. I'll have to talk to you after the show about a position I'm interested in, the chief absurdist. 
but uh, <laughs> something we'll have to get into later. But yeah, always a, a great time to contribute here, and, and uh, yeah, thank you. I think Chris is probably about to say, and I'll beat him to the punch, that's a portfolio that I'd have to vacate first, but, uh, <laughs> but I'm willing to do it. <laughs> well, maybe a chief panicist. And there I, you go. <laughs> uh, I'll come up with something. Yeah, and uh, as we go around the table here, uh, a gentleman I want to recognize, uh, first time participant I believe in anything Pantheon or Pantheon adjacent, not as far as the surveys go because he's done them before, but as far as participation in the roundtables, uh, all the, the different nodes of connection here of the FDH Lounge. Just mentioned Johnny Adams, a long time member uh, of the crew that we hang out with here, uh, been in fantasy football with this guy and a close personal friend forever. The guy who got me back into broadcasting in 03, hate mail to him, uh, at uh, the old Sports Talk Network. So I, I like to say about folks like uh, Ken Detweiler, a dignitary before there was such a thing. And that would be Ron Glasnap, uh, my old uh, friend, host of Reality Check with myself and Dave Adams. There's your um, note of connection there, uh, John's brother. And uh, the first show I did when I got back into broadcasting, enjoyed it immensely, and a uh, show that has had a lot to do, I think, with the influence of this show. So uh, I was thrilled when uh, you submitted your, uh, your your answers back, Ron, when you indicated you'd be available for today. So thanks a lot for being here. And I have to apologize for everyone for getting Rick back into this thing <laughs> for the past whatever it is, 15 years that he's been doing this. That's right. Hate mail to Ron. And uh, he, he, he reawoke that uh, sleeping uh, dragon, so to speak, here. But uh, from reality check dot 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 that was one of the influences that led to the FDH lounge FDH lounge debuting January 14th 2007 as I say a cold snowy night at the uh, station that Chris and I were there for along with our other original dignitaries and uh, again we always try to observe the anniversary in some kind of a special way and uh, again this is not Pantheon but this is Pantheon adjacent as far as how we're going about this so the different categories that we go through on all of this the first one that we're going to look at, the one in this uh, segment, is going to be sports. So we have answers back from our participants on sports in the 2010s and on the 2020s, whatever they thought the most noteworthy story was. So I'm going to run through these. We'll do a little bit of discussion afterwards on this. Members of the FDH Academy of Arts and Sciences, so going a little bit broader uh, than the dignitaries themselves. Of course, all dignitaries are a part of that, but uh, other friends and influences of the show and uh, so we got some great answers here from everyone who participated the sports one uh, this is going to be probably the longest as far as running through the answers subsequent categories are going to be a little shorter and we will forego this lengthy introduction for any other categories and get right into it so for sports what we have we start with uh, a new member of the academy Tim Trammell sports 2010s maybe next year for the Browns sports 2020s go Buckeyes uh, three guesses as to where Tim lives, by the way. Uh, Simon Applebaum, a uh, very good friend of the show from the New York area. Uh, college football playoff format established new professional leagues for both men and women established in such sports as soccer, lacrosse, and rugby. That's for the 2010s. In the 2020s, we will see a successful winter-slash-spring pro football league. Vinnie Mac would be glad to hear that, I'm sure, because the XFL is about to start. Next month, uh, Ron Glasnap uh, in the 2010s, improved safety and equipment, care for the athlete, and realization that their health has been elevated in the past decade. It wasn't that long ago we were told to suck it up and get back in there rather than make sure everyone is playing the sport they love safely. 2020s, gambling is only going to increase with the expansion of the Internet, and sports will lead that parade. Expect to be able to bet on every device you own legally, especially after governments figure out how to get their percentage of the profits. Johnny Adams, elements in the 2010s, HDTV, streaming live sports on multiple devices, 2020s, uh, China and India markets, uh, paid NCAA athletes, interactive TV, personalized red zone for your team. Karen Cahill, LeBron returning to Cleveland in the 2010s, 2020s, Browns winning a championship. Once again, three guesses as to where Karen lives. My brother Mike Morris, uh, 20, uh, 2010s, transfer portal in college football, totally changes the game. Instead of recruiting a kid and sitting on him, now you have to keep him happy as well. Coaches will cobble together great teams from transfers, look at the playoffs to see the early impacts. I know it's a late in the decade change, but still a big deal. 2020s, new helmet technology for football players. They need to solve this problem to save the sport. They might look like bobblehead dolls, but they have to solve this. Anthony Patron, 2010s, the most important development has been the change in TV in the 2010s. So many developments change how we watch all sports, pylon cams, pitch tracker, etc. 2020s. I believe LeBron will do one more tour in Cleveland. Bronny will be on the team regardless of whether he is a worthy player or not. 
Tom Denk, 2010s, LeBron in the NBA, 2020s, final destruction of NCAA basketball. I assume he's referring to the one-and-done thing getting repealed in the next couple of years. I'm not quite sure, but that'd be my guess. Matt Patrone, 2010s, all the coaches and QBs that went through the Browns, record breaker, 2020s, somehow Peyton Manning will become part owner of the Browns. Nate Noy, 2010s, change of the NBA game. Look at the differences between the first and last season of the decade. Field goal percentage and three-point field goal percentage were exactly the same, but five more threes made per team per game and 13.9 more taken. Pace went from 92.7 to 100, so that's 14.6 more possessions per game. Notice two-point average went down, but percentage went up, so players are taking better two-point shots, analytics, and action. Fewer fouls also are a result of more threes. A shot not as likely to get fouled on, of course. Free throw percentage went up. Fewer goons taking shots, I guess, because fouls were the same. 21.6 more points per game, not the same sport from the beginning of the end of the decade. 2020s, I anticipate the continued self-imposed decline of MLB. The younger generation has no interest in the sport, and the league has turned to gimmicks like a juiced ball. Bad move, MLB. Tim Faust, 2010s. This was actually the most difficult one to assess, as it's difficult to come up with one trend that transcends all sports in an equally impactful manner. You've got the inmates now running the asylum in the NBA, a more broad shift in MLB to adopt what was previously small market dynasty building and rules in the NFL meant to favor offenses, <clears throat> I mean protect players against injuries in the NFL, but one trend that is more of a continuation of previous decades, but I believe is continuing in importance, is the explosion of live TV rights. Uh, it is keeping major uh, sports from collectively killing the goose that laid the golden egg, most other factors are negatively impacting profitability growth, skyrocketing salaries, flattening of attendance, apathy toward entitled athletes, and so on. But fortunately for those who benefit from the business of sports, live TV sports command a premium from advertisers given the relative comparison to other TV content that is negatively impacted by DVRs and on-demand content. While local TV rights continue upward and all signs are the next NFL deal will continue massively upward, there has to be a point of diminishing returns sometime within the next decade. 2020s for Tim Faust. What may be the factor in the next decade that most counters the live TV sports fee increases is the popularity of esports. It's already taking hold. And while I don't know much about it, I see the next generation's attraction to watching virtual competition and my children's fascination with watching YouTube videos of people playing Fortnite and Minecraft for literally hours. These YouTubers are making millions out of their parents' basements, good for them, and corporate in investors, including pro sports leagues themselves, are taking note. By the way, uh, Tim Faust, fellow original FBH Lounge uh, dignitary. Steve Servillo, uh, his 2010s answer, New England Patriots Dynasty, 2020s, use of new technology to speed up games, get calls correct, and of course, cheat. My answer, Rick Morris, uh, megastar continuity for the 2010s. Sometimes they'll be at the forefront for two whole decades, i.e. Ali slash Kareem, but very rare. The carryover from the 2020s was insane. LeBron, Brady, Federer, Nadal, and Serena, and consider how rare it is in tennis alone. 2020s, if the football bubble pops as it might do to health-related issues, CTE, liability matters, etc., then hoops will gain on them somewhat for number one sport in America or surpass them if football's problems overwhelm them, but all other sports domestically will be solidified just as ditches in an increasingly fragmented landscape. So, gentlemen, when you, when you throw it open uh, to the people here and you say take it whatever direction you want to take it in, uh, both in terms of detail involved and thoughts involved, all over the map. You guys have had this for a couple of days to look at here. I just throw it open to whoever's got any thoughts about uh, what we just heard, because uh, in a lot of ways it was a blur. <laughs> I think there's a lot of reference in here to technology changing sports. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we've seen a lot of that, like in my answer. You get more to now you can watch a hockey game and they got a little thing on the puck that shows you where it's at. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, we're looking at that's the big trend is the technology in sports. Although they were doing the puck tracker in the 90s with Fox, and that was that was something I got away from because there were a lot of people bitching about it. But uh, I remember my grandmother enjoyed it for what that was worth. But, uh, well, I think the technology has really increased the stakes in some of these games because it illuminates mistakes quite clearly. For instance, the, the interference call, that was quite obvious. But when you're talking about some of these other plays that are, they can break it down to frame by frame and, you know, it's still being called live, so there's got to be a, a, a an in-between place we've got to get to there. But I would agree with that because uh, again, this is I think this is probably going to be a theme as we go through all the different categories here. 
And one of the FDH lounge dignitaries, a uh, gentleman who's been on the show mostly for basketball, but we've had him on for other sports as well, Ben Chu, he and I are always talking about a lot of things with technology, and, and he's, he's somebody that's tried to do some of his own broadcast-type things. And just the, the notion, and we're going to find this probably in the other areas, I would think, as we would go along, and I particularly want to ask you about this, Chris, is that we're, we're living in a moment in time that, they're going to look back on decades from now, however much longer, if we're still here on Earth, uh, optimistically, uh, and and say that this was the time when everything was changing and evolving. Like, we're living through that time, and we're trying to get to what it's going to look like subsequently. And it, to me, it's all just one big, long transitional period here. You know, we're trying to we're trying to get clear of what's happening. You know, the 2010s, we're adapting through some of these different changes in the technology and the presentation, but... I don't know that it necessarily looks like what it's going to look like, you know, when it reaches some sort of culmination. Well, you just hit on what my theme for today was going to be, and that is, and throughout all these topics, mm -hmm. is the effect um, for good or for ill, um, depending on how it's interpreted, of technology in all these areas. I think what we're going to be seeing is um, not a revolution, uh, but a continued evolution of um, sports, entertainment, politics, government, um, our lives in general. And there will be some uh, in perceived improvements. There will be, I think, also increased fragmentation um, and, of course, even more transparency. And, and for me, in the 2010s, the, uh, in the teens, so to speak, um, I think that uh, my biggest element as it relates to sports was the adoption of social media and its, and its growth as it relates to how we interact with these sports, um, how we interact with these athletes. They are all now instantly available for comment and frequently do. They have uh, more of a personal relationship with fans uh, in a way that they never did previously. Um, and so that's creating transparency that people, I think, in the past never had to their stars, the way sports operate, the business behind the scenes. Um, I think it creates, again, some element of fragmentation and that people, um, because once they know more about these processes, um, you know, they, they feel more alignment with a particular athlete versus a team. Uh, at the same time, maybe there's more resentments. So I think this is going to be the trend line that you're going to see through all these topics is how these technological evolutions are changing the way we interact with, and in this case, sports, not only direct you know, access and communication, but um, now you have social media directly, uh, you know, uh, televising, for lack of a better word, mm -hmm. broadcasting uh, live sports. You know, Twitter's putting out live sports. Hulu's doing live sports. All these different platforms are engaging. And back to uh, somebody's previous comment about TV, local TV market costs, mm -hmm. um, and those contracts going up in value. Um, you're going to find technology will promote certain aspects and then start to diminish certain things. For example, I think these technologies over the next... 20 years are going to be uh, a real help to, say, football, mm -hmm. which has otherwise got a real problem, as been, which has been diagnosed by our panelists here as you went through it, on things like um, injuries and brain trauma. So you're going to see technology, you know, we have less kids we know from in the numbers playing football, mm -hmm. so you're going to see a decrease in the volume in terms of not only playing it, the talent in the pipeline, therefore also the interest, kids that aren't playing tend to not care about watching it down the road. Um, but at the same time, technology is also going to promote it through gambling, the mm -hmm. increased elements of gambling, fantasy football. Mm -hmm. So the interest on one hand, I think initially, will actually continue to rise for football. I don't see football see, starting to see a diminished fall off in terms of popularity for probably at least another 20 years. But it is coming. Um, but I think you're going to continue to see growth in the short term because of those technological advancements before eventually the decreased participation, et cetera, et cetera, 
changes the trajectory for football. Very good. And I want to get some thoughts on some of the things you said there, because I'm sure there, there are some reactions to that. One thing I want to say in particular is, because I forecast a potential downfall for football in the nearer term, what that is contingent on, we did a, uh, an interview on the show with uh, uh, excellent uh, former defensive lineman, uh, Chidi Ahanatu. He's been on the show a couple times. And I had discussed with him, this is a subject because he's very interested in, in the CTE stuff, feels that he might have uh, gotten it uh, himself when he was playing. And uh, there was a story that he had promoted on uh, Twitter that he had found, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal, that the NFL's hanging by a thread and nobody really realizes it. There's one insurance company out there that's willing to cover them for the liability right now, for the long-term costs and everything like that. And there's one woman in particular, an executive, who basically holds this whole thing in her hands. And for right now, it's all still happening. She sees a pathway to keeping it going, whatever. I don't think there's a plan B for when the NFL no longer has liability for the immense costs that are coming. So to me, that's sort of the thing there. Social media, I also want to flag, too. Uh, I first noticed it, I think, I want to say maybe 2011, right about this time, 2011. Jay Cutler, remember that, you guys, uh, when he did not play, or he left, I guess, the NFC Championship game against the Packers, and he was on the bike on the sidelines, and he got dragged on Twitter. And that that seemed like a new thing at the time, like, oh, we have this immediate water cooler thing now. And, like, nine years later, we think nothing of it. But this was the moment, it, 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 there were moments during the decade when it kind of came to pass, and where it was sort of this transitional time to, to where we are now. But... Uh, any, anybody got any other thoughts about some of the things that just came up in the last couple of minutes? Because there is a lot to unpack. Actually, what he was talking mostly about, as he mentioned sports, is the people in their attention spans. Yes. How long can you stand to watch something? Mm -hmm. That's why younger people don't care to watch for baseball as much, because mm -hmm. it's a slower sport. That's why you're introducing fantasies and gambling and When's the last time you heard a moment of silence at a basketball game? Right. Um, because this is why they have to keep doing these things. Esports, which personally I hate as a term because right. it has nothing to do with sports. Right. Uh, e gaming, maybe. I might buy that one, but it yeah. has nothing to do with sports. Um, that keeps your attention because something's always going on. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what all the professional sports, even the collegiates in. The high schools, just to get people interested, mm -hmm. are how do we keep your interest in doing something mm -hmm. and paying attention and being part of things? Right. I would agree with that. I think that that is, is something there. And, and again, Chris, you and I, for a long time, we've been on the whole thing about esports and everything like that. Like uh, what, I, what I was saying to uh, my, my nephew and nieces over the holidays here, you know as far as being get off the line. Like, my generation played video games. We didn't watch other ones. Well, still plays. That doesn't watch other people playing them. And, you know, you were the first one, I think, to flag that curiosity to me. I think when he I remember exactly when I did it. Yeah. I was on a business trip in central Pennsylvania around mm -hmm. State College, mm -hmm. and I had been listening to the radio for about an hour because mm -hmm. um, I was listening, I'd been listening to a show, and then it went off, and they went into an eSports talk show they were talking about these people about like they were football players baseball players talking about their performance in the last competition the team they're putting together gee i don't know what do you think how's he going to look on such and such platform with i mean they were breaking stuff down like we were breaking like we would break down the nfc east and i was fascinated and i listened to this for a while because i didn't understand any of it mm -hmm. or the games they were playing but I was fascinated that there were networks now, and I was listening to satellite radio, mm -hmm. that were now dedicating, in essence, prime time radio, which that slot, you know, right after sort of the, you know, the uh, the drive home time, mm -hmm. to this these topics. And this was what I don't know, four years ago, something like something, that, you know, five yeah. years ago. And I and I was fascinated by that, and I remember I called you immediately and said, Rick, what do you make of this? And you're like, I don't know what the heck you're talking about. And I said, man, this thing is coming. I mean, the fact that you've got yeah. ESPN and you've got you know Fox and Sirius XM, they're putting this stuff out. That means they think somebody's listening. Yeah. Um, and that somebody cares. Otherwise, they're not doing it. Right. Because it, for them, it's all about money. It's not about it, and, and, and getting the earballs to, to pay attention. It's also about content. Right. right, having something to broadcast, no matter what it is, that's honestly why you see all kinds. I saw the national cornhole championship the other right. day on oh, ESPN. Yeah, yeah. Like, 
what are you? What are we doing here? Yeah, and but it wasn't it, even on Ocho Day. Yeah. Huh? And, and by the okay. way, two of the finalists in the championship were two guys from OU. Really nice. <laughs> Bobcat, Bob. I don't know. How that's this is my go. Bobcat dialing for you for today. Yeah. Herbert on the hot. Okay. Herbert Herbert on the hot. Do it. I don't know how that's going to go over with our resident Red Hawk here. Yeah. But, uh, well, you do know I just that, let that go away. All right. You do know that they do know that people watch because, and this is funny. The other day I was over at a friend's house, and her kid's sitting there watching YouTube. Mm -hmm. And I said, what are you watching? He goes, I'm watching other people play video games. Right. Why? Yeah. Play the video games. Right. Well, these games have gotten so hyper-detailed. It's interesting. I bought a PS4 about a year and a half ago to kind of relate to my nephew. These games, it's not like Centipede. You mm -hmm. are getting in there, and you are committing to it. And it's no wonder why there's many people that have kind of taken their disposable time, and they would just want to spend that time playing video games. Because they take hours upon hours to get through the games and this is not your typical play and start over uh three you know three lives and we'll start over it's not pac-man oh no no no, no. Right. i mean you're talking like uh you know and scenes and the money and creativity into some of these games there's actually a current i've got to go catch it there's a uh, uh an art show uh, there's an exhibit at the akron art museum in regards to video games and art which i've got to catch but but the uh, symbolism and the thought behind some of these games is is really interesting. But it takes uh, they take hours to complete. I mean, I can imagine. Well, and I think what we're also talking whether it's attention span, the variety of things that people are watching, um, comes back to my point about fragmentization. What technology does is that we're not living in a world anymore where you had three networks. Mm -hmm. That showed us what they decided we should watch. That's what we all grew up with. Right. You know, watching three networks. We got a couple of games a week, if, if we were lucky. And that's what we got to see in a couple of sports. Now, through technology, internet, social media, these kids are in, they are exposed to so, such an array of things that are available all the time, anytime, at their fingertips. That is going to have an effect on the major sports in a way that I don't think that they quite yet know how to navigate. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and and they're going to have to figure it out, because I think at some point that's going to be it. You're going to be gambling on an NFL game, uh, fantasy football, while you're also you know playing Minecraft 12 or whatever, mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, if that's what it's going to be about. These guys are all going to be competing. So there, at some point there probably is going to be some diminishing return for leagues like the NFL and the NBA. Um, in terms of uh, media dollars. Probably, yeah. I, I would see that being the case. The but first one affected, I believe, will be baseball. Yes, yes, I think they will be. And Ron, as somebody that does uh, sports production in baseball, uh, along with some other sports here, what are some of the challenges you're seeing as far as trying to keep it uh, relevant on an entertainment level? Well, the key to any of that stuff is that sports is DVR-proof. Mm -hmm. yes. Nobody can afford to not watch the game if they want to see it because... They will find out what happens on Twitter. They will find out what happens on YouTube. They will, whatever. Mm -hmm. Somebody will send them a text of, hey, did you see that play? So since with sports being DVR proof, therefore they always will have a demand. Mm -hmm. um, at some point, does local rights go down? Yeah. But I think what you're going to end up seeing, and I know I mentioned it uh, for something in the future, is I think every league is going to have their own streaming network very soon. Mm-hmm. I think you're going to be able to get all your NHL games, all your MLB games, all on your streaming service, and you're not going to have to worry about networks and whatever else they show, except the networks will have playoffs and postseason and, and whatever they can sell. Very possibly, and I know we're going to revisit this when we get to the entertainment stuff here because that has a lot to do, and also probably the technology uh, category as well. That, that, and that's the fascinating thing. So many of these things are all, these categories are, are intertwined. Maybe the American and the world news a little bit less so, but a lot of these other ones are kind of intertwined with each other. So uh, before we get to the very end, because I want to go through and just kind of highlight a couple of the different answers here. Anybody got anything else before we move to uh, highlighting some of the answers? I was I was just going to say that since um, is that I what I see coming in the next decade is. Um, Continued modernization. Mm -hmm. You know what I in my head. I, I sort of looked at a couple of things. One, um, look for uh, baseball to adopt a computer strike zone mm -hmm. where an umpire is an afterthought. There'll yeah. probably be one, um, but there will the computer will be the ultimate first and last decider of balls and strikes. Uh, the umpire will be the it be behind home plate for those sort of human elements that they have to make decisions on as it relates to play. 
Um, and then I think that uh, the XFL is going to be mildly successful. I think you saw this last league. What was it called? The American, AAFL. Yeah. yeah. The, the American Association of American Football in America, or whatever they were called. Um, <laughs> it sounded like a fantasy football yeah. abbreviation. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. It, was, it was a terrible name. Weren't we in an AAFL? But I think, I think? we all <laughs> saw with that, other than their failure at capitalization, they had something. Yeah, there was an interest in the public. The public was watching. There was, and in the case they had just launched, and people yeah. were paying attention. They were watching those games, not like an NFL game, but they right. were watching and paying attention, like a Dif car crash. Well, yeah. in some ways, <laughs> but we also, but I think the the XFL with the capital behind it, and some of the learned lessons, and not having a, you know, some jack wagon like Bill Pullian involved. Um, they are, I think, stand a chance to actually succeed where they failed. Now, I say mild success. I think the effect that that's going to have mm -hmm. in the next decade is their success and how they're adapting rules to, again, these modern technologies will end up having a direct effect at the end of the decade on the NFL. Watch for the NFL to uh, start by, by changing some of their rules more in line with some of the stuff that the XFL starts doing in terms of how they progress the game and how it relates to media. Um, with an eventual 2030s point in time, the NFL, as part of this discussion that we're having about fragmentization and the pressures these leagues are under and these local contracts, etc., watch for the NFL to eventually absorb the XFL. Um, at the end of this process of almost, oh, let's say, 15 years. Now we're getting into the 2030s. Mm -hmm. But to me, that's the eventuality there in terms of, again, trying to maintain these, these dollars that these owners have become accustomed to. That makes sense. Only thing I will say, and this is one of these things that uh, anybody that's not a wrestling nerd wouldn't necessarily know about, but there is a legal challenge to them potentially, and that is that Vince McMahon, when he started the XFL this time around, sold off a bunch of stocks, said it was independent of uh, the company, whatever. I believe there is uh, litigation pending uh, from some investors that are pointing to company resources being used in, on uh, the XFL. And so he may have to address that at some point in time here, so we shall see about that. But uh, an excellent point about the XFL and the future here. Uh, going through, and uh, this is this is optional here at the end for anybody that would like to uh, cast a vote or, or whatever, but I feel like in, in the sense of, of going through and just recognizing on some of the answers, just kind of giving a pat on the back here to some of the people if we can, uh, on the 2010s and the 2020s, I'll start it off. Uh, on the 2010s, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give, give my vote to Anthony for uh, the thing about the TV technology because we talked about this a decent amount here. and. Uh, so I think that was a noteworthy answer for the 2020s. I'll say Tim Faust with what he was talking about with eSports because uh, whether we like it or not, and I think for all of us the answer would be not, uh, he's talking about something that's going on here and it's happening and uh, got to acknowledge it. So uh, those are the ones I would single out. Anybody well, else the, got any the thoughts? the 2010s, I'll give a vote to your brother. Okay. Because I do really like the transfer portal idea in college football because mm -hmm. it definitely makes it more intriguing. Okay. Um, and for the 2020s, uh, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to go with uh, yours. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, yeah, got to gotta see how this happens here, and I hope I'm wrong about the NFL. I hope it stays right. strong, but uh, it, it, it may not. So uh, we'll, we'll see. Uh, any, anybody else with any thoughts here? All right, so... Oh. Yeah. I, I was going to say, I, I like uh, in the 2010s, uh, Ron's reference to the uh, uh, safety equipment and uh, the transition into uh, uh, trying to reconnect with uh, playing the sports safely. Okay. And then uh, for 2020s, uh, Chris's reference to kind of uh, personalization, customization, uh, that interaction um, uh, uh, with, with each individual sport, whether that's through... Uh, Again, uh, you know, uh, interacting with your your actual team, red zone for your own team, so to speak, in a way. Yes. But yeah, yeah, and that was, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, that was something that you were talking about in your answer as well, there. So you anticipated that, and that was a, that was a good point as well. So, uh, anybody else got any more uh, thoughts here on sports? Uh, you know, I 
we brought it up about how much you're doing on social media. I think what we're really watching mm -hmm. is your players developing their brand and they talk about this all the time yep whether it's their shoe brand their clothing mm -hmm. brand their social yeah. media brand their whatever and it's not just athletes it's the gamers and it's the influencers and whatever else how much do you really know your athlete you think you do but you really don't right you know what they want you to know yeah they want you to know the influence that they want to have they want to be able to have here's where I can put my voice out and say what I want to truth or not doesn't matter it's my voice and this is what I'm saying so therefore this is what I want you to believe whereas we all know the truth is somewhere in the middle so well, unless they're Antonio Brown mm -hmm. and then we know exactly what they're all about that's right that's right Thank you, uh, Twitter. Which, is, which is not a good thing <laughs> but, yeah uh, of the kids that are out there and who have been seeing him forever how many people think they know who LeBron James is everybody does yeah everybody thinks they know who he is yeah no, you know the public LeBron James and what he puts out on media and what he's always covered on ESPN.com and whatever and what he puts out in his cryptic tweets. That's what you know. Do you actually know the person? No. Now, I would argue his cryptic tweets and some of the little things that sort of dribble out actually gives us the insight. Thanks to social media. Well, oh, more sure. indication. When, yes, when, I think those yeah. are. I think those are stronger indicators. When Absolutely. we see those occasional, where like you know, you get an Instagrammer who she's like, "Oh look, LeBron James dropped into my DMs," <laughs> um, you know, uh, and some of these other and the cryptic tweets uh, about you know his teammates. When he would pass him, actually tells me exactly. Love. I think I know a lot about LeBron James. Yes, that's true. More than he wants you to know. More that's right. But that's that. the beauty of social media is that you can put all this facade and you can have your publicists and others work on it, but it's right there. And you have a tendency to tweet something out in the, in the heat of the moment that maybe it's somebody else, or you do a cryptic tweet, or you drop into some Instagram model's DMs. Man, it gets out. People find out about you. So there's just no way to hide, I think, in this day and age. That's true. That's a very good point and an excellent segue because next categories we got coming up here entertainment slash pop culture and technology. I said it early on, a lot of these are going to kind of bleed together, and you're seeing it here as we go full circle on the sports ones. I want to thank our panel for this excellent start to our uh, celebration of the anniversary of the FDH Lounge, and as I say, next up, entertainment and pop culture.